Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There was a lot about rules and following rules and doing the right thing in the lessons this morning. In the end, Jesus reminds us that sometimes we focus too much on the rules. Sometimes we focus on them so much they separate us from one another, from Jesus and from God. It's ironic. So many rules are about keeping us safe, about keeping our community safe, and about protecting us from all those things that can harm us physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. But rules can also become stumbling blocks or logs in our eyes when we use these laws, when we use the rules in a way that negates the humanity, the belovedness of another. What might be important to remember about Jesus is that he was a Jew. He was a teacher of the Torah. He studied the laws, taught the laws, and then pointed out when some people spent too much time with the laws that they forgot the greatest rule of them all. God first. Sometimes the rules get in the way of doing what it is God needs us to do and be in relationship with God. Did it really matter that some of the followers of Jesus did not wash their hands before they ate? Was the cleanliness of their hands a measure of their devotion to God? Or was the washing of their hands something like when we say, but we've always done it this way, but we don't necessarily remember why? Or was it about health and wellness? Of course, for health and wellness, to say we should take care to clean ourselves. We might have different ideas of how and when and the frequency of becoming clean is necessary, but all in all, we probably can agree washing our hands regularly is a good practice. But thinking about this story, consider this. What if their messy hands were signs that they were not afraid to do some of the messy work caring for their fellow human? What if their dirty hands became a symbol of being active agents of God's love? The Pharisees didn't really care about why their hands were dirty. They cared that some of the disciples did not follow the rules, the rituals, the rites, the traditions, that had been established in the Jewish law. And as Pharisees, the rules, rituals, rites, and traditions were what mattered to them. You might be thinking that the Pharisees were just trying to push Jesus' buttons, trying to prove their superiority, trying to show that they knew the laws. You might think that they were there to cause trouble with Jesus. But that's not who the Pharisees were. The Pharisees had a very important role in the Jewish life. Pharisees debated and discerned and argued about scripture and about scripture all the time. Jewish scholars still do. They spend time asking one another what they think about the ancient words, asking what the tone was, what was happening in history, who was in charge. Could this have been sarcasm? Or a joke, or a story that didn't need all the ex explanation that we might need because it was such a deep, familiar story to the people, kind of like an inside joke or family history. They discussed, and they still discuss, how the world has changed, how the context is different, how we are not what we once were. They bring the ancient words into today and negotiate with them, massage them, listen to the nuances and read the historical documents in ways that keep scripture alive. In a way, they're anthropologists, seeking knowledge and clarity through significant study, discussion, and discernment with an 
about the Torah. It might seem that the Pharisees and other religious scholars were bad guys, but that's not the case. While the Pharisees and others did not always like the way Jesus was interpreting scripture, and especially when he was commenting on the ways they practiced their faith, and while voices may have been raised and some relationships appear to suffer, this verbal wrestling with one another, this wrestling with scripture, this wrestling with the way they showed their devotion to God was their job. It is through such wrestling these people came closer to God. Jesus just didn't make it easy. He kept trying to change the focus back to the basics. Love God. Love people. Treat others the way you would like to be treated. When we follow these rules, everything else will fall into place. Nitpicking the other things just gets in the way of our relationship with God. And yet, we have rules and rights and traditions that keep us connected in our denomination and with Christianity and with God. <clears throat> they can also sometimes hold us back from being able to be the body of Christ and to see the holy in one another. Unfortunately, there are times when our stories are so wrapped up in our doctrine and our church polity, we sometimes cannot see God. That's when it is important to pay attention to what Jesus said and to step back and look at the bigger picture. I read an interview with John Tarrant, the Bishop of South Dakota, who is retiring next year. He was talking about how the churches in South Dakota are different than in most places. 50% of the members are Native American. The poverty level is immense. There isn't money enough in these communities to afford propane, to heat the buildings enough to keep pipes from freezing. So many of these churches do not have indoor plumbing. They have all houses. Some do not even have electricity. Native churches receive significant financial help from both the Episcopal Church's general convention budget and from the diocese, and from donations and help from around the world. Lay leadership has decreased since the introduction of the 1979 prayer book, as our worship then became more centered on the Eucharist, even now, one priest might serve seven or eight congregations. Some churches have a hard time recruiting people for the vestry. Bishop John's response? Don't have a vestry. Instead, decide what needs to be done and figure out who will do it, and then get it done. Bishop Gerard has had to make some decisions that don't quite match some of the ways of the Episcopal Church. He said, we are, called, we, are, we are being called into faithfulness. And what that faithfulness looks like depends upon the community that you are. As a result, he has let go of some of the human traditions, the human precepts that we have turned into doctrine. And the Episcopal people of South Dakota are living out the commandments in ways that match their faith. The bishop has found ways for these folks to be the body of Christ in the ways that fit them best. He said, your self-worth is always and only grounded in the living God in Christ Jesus. Only and always. Everything else is about how we're going to live it. In other words, he has given them permission to have dirty hands. What seems most important in Bishop Tarot's story and in today's gospel is that Jesus is reminding us that we should be placing our 
focus on God, not on the human design rules and regulations we have made regarding our faith. We are to focus on the commandment to love God first, and then on the commandment to love one another as God loves us. The world may change. The Jewish and other religious leaders may dis debate the scripture in light of, or in spite of, the current world climate. We might find our reasons for washing our hands different than they were 2,000, 200, 20, or even two years ago. But that doesn't change, but what doesn't change, but what does not change, is what Jesus repeats throughout his ministry. Love God. Love each other. Let us pray. Empty our hearts, O oh God, of all that distracts us from your love. Fill us with the ability and grace to share your love to the world. Dirty our hands as we work to bring hope to this broken world. Help us discern the ways in which you desire us to live faithful lives. To your glory. Amen.